I'm speaking with Sean Garish, author of How Smart Machines Think. Thank you for speaking with me. Thank you for chatting with me as well. So first tell me, how did you get into studying and writing about this subject? Uh, originally, I it began with some questions that I had around how self-driving cars worked. I had seen some talks back around the year 2010 uh, describing self-driving cars, and I had been studying machine learning and artificial intelligence and practicing it for a little while at that point. And the, the main question that um, came to mind was, well, it, it, I'm supposed to know about these topics, and yet I don't know how self-driving cars work. And so I was wondering whether maybe I, I hadn't studied um, these topics well enough, or maybe I, I, I didn't know the material as well as I should have. And so I, I started trying to research it, and what the conclusion I came to was that a lot of these topics are not taught in a typical machine learning or AI course. Um, you might have to take a special course for it, which isn't something that most people can, can find at their universities. Mm-hmm. And so I found this uh, thing happening again and again. So a number of times I um, had a question about, well, how do these, um, for example, neural networks that recognize pictures of cats uh, work? And how does the Netflix recommendation engine work? And as I started to research these, it, it occurred to me that maybe other people might want to understand these, these answers to these questions as well. And so that's, that's really how it started, largely around just my own curiosity in the topics. Now, what's your graduate degree in? I studied machine learning. Mm-hmm. Um, so technically it was in computer science, that's the general department, but it was in machine learning. Um, specifically mm-hmm. in the area known as topic models. These are models of large document collections. So tell me then about the book. How, how do you organize it and, and break it down? Sure. So the book covers a, a number of different breakthroughs that have happened in the last 20 years. And these breakthroughs are uh, things that you've probably seen in the media about machine learning or AI. For example, self-driving cars, AlphaGo, uh, computer programs that can play Atari games, and uh, IBM's Jeopardy playing Watson. And I devote anywhere from two to three chapters per topic so that you can, as, as you're reading, you might come upon several different chapters that talk about one of these topics. It's broken down sequentially, so there will be several different chapters about a given topic. I do start with self-driving cars and then move on to Netflix recommend, the Netflix recommendation challenge, which I chose those two topics as the earlier topics in the book because they have enough material that is common to the rest of the book that I wanted to get into the reader's minds early so that I could keep on bringing up those themes again and again. Do you focus on uh, just software algorithms and such, or do you also get into hardware? I talk a little bit about hardware. The main places where I talk about hardware are in self-driving cars, where I talk about the, the laser scanners that they use, the LiDAR, basically, in order to perceive. I also talk a little bit about hardware in the I have a chapter, a couple of chapters about games, and um, in one section that's pretty short, I talk about how the chess playing computer that beat uh, the best human player was did use hardware for it. So a lot of more recent breakthroughs, you can oftentimes think of them as mostly software, but a lot of the uh, early things, especially the chess playing computer, d- depended very heavily on having really good custom hardware. So what what is the most complex part of this uh, for people to understand? I, I know it's all complex, uh-huh. but are, are there any sticky points that really um, are difficult for people to grasp? That's a good question. I I think that one part that was, I guess there were two parts that I found difficult to to try to explain, and I, I did my best by just going over the, the material again and again. I think that one part that was difficult to explain IBM's Jeopardy playing Watson. And the, the reason I think it's difficult is just because there are so many different components to the system. And they devoted, I don't remember how many papers, but it was a number of different research papers to the topic. And my goal was to try to distill that down to a, a simple story that would be interesting to any individual. I mean, really any of these systems I think are easy to understand if you look at the individual pieces. It's just that trying to um, see how they fit together, I think that that's the, the most difficult thing. So, for example, with IBM's Jeopardy playing Watson, you have a, a system where it goes through multiple phases in trying to answer a Jeopardy question. In the first phase, you have this this uh, question analysis portion where the system will try to analyze the question and pick out the most interesting parts from the perspective of, of trying to figure out the best set of answers. Then it'll go into a process where it does essentially, uh, you can think of it as issuing a bunch of Google searches. It's not actually talking to Google, but it's using its own search engine to come up with 
the list of pages and sources that will have an answer. And then it goes through and teases through each of these potential data sort uh, documents that it finds and tries to look for candidate answers. Then it scores the answers and then it sorts them and so on. And each of these is, is worth, each of these different five or so phases is worth um, a, a research paper in itself. And so I think that really trying to get um, get across to readers the the fact that each of these phases isn't really that complicated was um, a bit of a challenge. But I and I, I would say say probably that something like the IBM Jeopardy playing Watson system was the, the one of the more difficult ones. Where does the intelligence part come in? Meaning, where does it differentiate from just um, going through data sets and and identifying? Yeah. You know what matches closest, and go, and moving on from there. Yeah. Um, is your question more specifically about IBM's Jeopardy playing Watson, or the more general more, uh, things in the book? More general. The, yeah, across the board. Yeah, I. That's a really good question, and I I don't know if I have a great answer for you, but in my view, one of the places where the intelligence comes in is that the in most of these machines, there's some sort of a search component that perform some amount of search. And and I do my best in the book to, to break these machines down in a, a fairly consistent way where there might be some perception layer and there might be some um, layer where they, they, an actuator layer, I'll call it, where they, they try to um, interact with the world. But there's also some layer that involves performing search where it's basically searching over the, all the different options that it has for its next move or its next action. And I think that in most cases, the intelligence shows up in that search. And you as the, the individual interacting with this may not realize that there's actually this search, this search algorithm actually happening. And the search might take the form of just going through a bunch of candidate moves and searching for the best move. Um, the search might take the form of um, going through a document search, like IBM Jeopardy playing Watson did, where the um, it goes through millions of answers into the answers, and it has to settle on one. But essentially, to do that, it needs to issue these search queries, like I was saying, and then it needs to score them, and then it needs to sort them by by that score. And then, and it's really only when it does that search that, for you as a human interacting with it, you know, it, it may not be evident that it's doing that search, but that's where I think its, it's intelligence really comes from. Hmm. So maybe I'm. Uh, simplifying this question I have maybe an oversimplification or, or maybe I'm not fully understanding something, but is there, is there a component to any of these machines that you look at where it takes data that isn't obviously part of whatever question it's dealing with, um, and sort of stores that as, you know, an extra bit of something that might affect its future? You know, and I, I'm thinking in terms of, of thought. You know, uh, machine thought. Um, does that question make sense? I, I think I missed the last thing you said. You're, you're speaking in terms of thought, and, and what was the last thing you said? Oh, just machine th- thought. You know, where where it's absorbing maybe more than than the bare minimum it needs to solve the problem. Um, oh, interesting. You know, that's a, a good question. And I one thing that I I think was the case for most of the things I talked about in the book is that they were really engineered specifically to solve the problem they were they were solving mm-hmm. and and so it's almost like a car it's like you and a car is engineered to drive down the road and it's not really engineered to um, to do a whole lot more mm-hmm. and if you want a car that can go off-road you can maybe you'll, you'll refine it in order to um, to drive off-road by changing its tires and changing its shocks and things like that mm-hmm. um, now the and I guess I'll come back to the example of the, um, well, maybe a self-driving car would be one example. Um, self-driving cars, there was a, an anecdote that I mentioned in the book where uh, a Google self-driving car was driving down the road, and they it came to a woman in an electric wheelchair um, driving around in the middle of the street chasing a duck with a broomstick. And this was such a... A, a bizarre situation. The car didn't really know what to do with it. I mean, it, it essentially did the right thing. It, it slowed down and waited for the road to clear and, and moved on. Mm-hmm. But um, it, it didn't have any concept of what this situation was. It just knew that there was some sort of ob- obstacle. And the 
this is how most of these, it, really all of these machines have so far, at least in terms of where we are with AI, it's how all of them work. Um, mm-hmm. They they almost always work based on human implemented rules. Um, and they might combine these rules in a really intelligent way and they might use this search algorithm to, to search for the best rule, but they, at least in none of the cases that they covered in the book, were they gathering information outside of something relevant to um, performing their like their core goal or their on um, their core mission mm-hmm. um, that that they start for later. So, from this research, do you feel that what you've seen, these examples you found, do you think yeah. it's the right path towards? Um, you know, as people like to think of robots that can think for themselves, you know, do you think, do you think what you're seeing is going down the right path or do you see the limitations where maybe a radical new approach may be needed to accomplish something like that? That's a good question. I think that with the, I think that the researchers who've worked on these problems have probably taken a pretty reasonable approach in that they've had very specific goals in mind, mm-hmm. and they've developed these these intelligent machines to to accomplish those goals. I think that if they're and so the research tends to be very directed um, because they're they're focused on these very specific and concrete goals. And it, I think that if they didn't have such concrete goals, it would be uh, a little bit difficult for them to to make much progress. Mm-hmm. Partially just because the the set of directions you might go is just enormous, and, and there are people studying different things that I think are relevant for um, broader intelligence, like memories for um, for neural networks and things like that that you might associate that you might associate with general intelligence. But I think that um, without a, a very specific task or goal, it's um it's just a little bit hard. Mm-hmm. Did any of your examples? I've read a book on, um, or part, read part of a book where, yeah. uh, basically you have software. Um, uh, software yeah. is designed to almost like a biological organism to sort uh-huh. of think and grow within certain parameters that are set. Um, and then it's set yeah. free. I don't know if you're, fa- I forget what that's called. It sounds like you're familiar with this, this idea. You know, I, 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 I do know that. There, it's not uncommon for um, people to use um, biological inspiration, uh, or basically to use biology as an inspiration for um, for the like the AI that they're building. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm at least somewhat familiar with the the, the concepts, not not too familiar. Mm-hmm. But so none of your examples uh, involve that sort of um, approach. Not necessarily. I mean, like, well, I do talk a fair amount about neural networks in the book. Mm-hmm. And um, and so those are biologically inspired, certainly. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, I would say that they're biologically inspired um, only up to a limited amount. Um, they still have to be they have still have to be implemented in silicon, and they have to follow deterministic programs. Mm-hmm. And um, I assume that our neurons and our brains are also following deterministic programs, that they may not be digital programs. But um, that said, I, I think that. Like most of the things that I talk about in the book are, I, I do try to emphasize actually that everything that happens in these machines is deterministic. And that, um, you can really, as long as you have a, um, a, a, well, one example I use is something like a mechanical Turing machine. So you can basically implement any of these intelligent machines as a, as a Turing machine. And you can basically create a Turing machine out of, um, wooden components where you just have a hand crank that you, that you continue to turn. And so, any of the intelligence that you see manifested in these machines could come out of a machine where you just have a, a um, hand crank. And um, and so it, it doesn't, in some sense, it doesn't matter whether it's a hand crank or something that's biologically inspired. It's still basically a machine, and it's still performing a sequence of, de- of very predictable actions, even if it doesn't look like that. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, before we move on to how you did your research, are there any... Um... Uh-huh other issues that you explore in the book that you'd like to mention? There were a few things that I think were, um, that, that came up again and again. One was just the, the sheer amount of the research, of manpower, rather, that went into this research. And so most of the projects took tens of people to actually complete. So it's, it's difficult, for example, I'd be 
shocked if anyone could, um, any one person could create a self-driving car on their own, even when that performs um, very poorly. And um, the and this happened again and again, where basically I noticed that any of these projects required the effort of a, of a pretty big group of people, um, or if it wasn't a big group of people, they at least had the backing of um, someone like IBM, for example. And um, so that was one thing that I thought was interesting, and it, it happened again and again. Another theme was that the competitions tended to be a very um, useful catalyst for um, affecting progress in these fields. So there were these challenges in the early, well, in the mid-2000s where self-driving cars were basically uh, competing against one another in the desert, and DARPA sponsored this challenge. Um, the Netflix recommendation engine was essentially... A, um, some of the things that they used for that came from a, this Netflix prize that was organized by Netflix where they offered a million dollars to the team that could produce the best uh, recommendation engine. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was um, there were these competitions that would happen fairly regularly with um, chess playing um, computers and competitions between computers and people. And um, I mean, the theme just seemed to happen again and again where there would be competitions that would um, foster uh, innovation in these different fields. Um, the other thing that I noticed was that the a lot of these intelligent machines have they might seem very different, like the IBM's Jeopardy playing Watson or self driving cars or um, recommendation engines or neural networks that can recognize pictures of cats. But they they tend to be made up of the same small components. And those components this is actually the original um, I, I thought about writing a slightly different book than this originally where I focused on the way to combine these different components into machines. And um, the what you end up finding is that in courses in AI or machine learning, you often have um, the books and lectures about the individual components of these machines. It's rare that they actually are discussed together in a way that um, helps you understand how these, these things work as a whole. Mm-hmm. Let me ask uh, sort of a, maybe a facetious and perhaps cynical question. Uh-huh. You know, you mentioned these prizes and contests and stuff. You know, someone yeah. might wonder, um, well, if, if if AI were really that important, shouldn't it, why isn't the market uh, taking care of this and, and developing quicker? You know, is it is I, mm-hmm. AI just kind of a cool thing for people to pursue, but in the end... That's all it is, mm-hmm. you know, or, or, you know, where, where is it really going? Yeah. What, what's the, the, mm-hmm. um, that's, yeah. that's a good question. I think that the, and I don't know if I have the, the right answer, but I have a couple of thoughts on it. Mm-hmm. And so I actually do had thought for a little while that we should have some sort of a, a competition to build an intelligent, um, like essentially conscious, uh, robot. And, I think that there were a few things that are holding us back. There was actually, I forget which news source it was, New York Times or Financial um, Times or something like this, where there someone had written a um, an op-ed uh, or not, a column saying that we should have a, a prize for AI, basically to offer a million dollars to someone who can create a, um, some sort of a conscious agent or something like this, you know. Um, I think the reason that it's difficult and that it hasn't happened um, uh, there are several reasons, I think. One is that we we don't even know how to define the, the right metric for um, something that is um, is intelligent, mm-hmm. right? Like, intelligence can take many different forms, and so um, it, we're in a phase right now where we, we still need to have a fairly narrow goal to, to make significant progress. And so the... Um, uh, neural networks, one way in which they made a lot of progress recently was with this image recognition challenge that was organized by someone named Faith Bailey. Lee. And um, the idea here is that uh, she created a data set with a uh, thousand different categories, and uh, I, mean, I think it was on the order of a million different images, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. And people would write programs to try to classify the objects in these images. And that, that was a fairly narrow task, right? Like, the goal was to basically figure out which labels apply to different images. Um, and it didn't involve things like having a memory or, like, performing different actions and like that. And so I think that we do have, um, I, I think that in narrow domains, it, it can help because we just have that focus. Um, again, otherwise we have too, too many directions and there's going to be a 
lot of debate about what the right metrics are to evaluate something. Um, another thought is that, it, 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 so it, you have fields like physics, though, where there are um, particle detectors being developed by international consortiums of 5,000 scientists. And I thought, why can't we have something like that for AI? And I think a challenge is that fields like physics, where that can happen, are much more mature. Mm-hmm. And we actually know how to do things with physics. Um, like, we know how to build a, a particle detector, and there's not really a whole lot of debate about how that should be done. Whereas in something like AI, um, there is a lot of debate. And so I think that um, that debate prevents us from, um, and it's healthy debate as well. I think that debate, though, means that it's going to be difficult to convince 5,000 researchers to work on one project. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that with competitions, that can still happen, but they still need to be narrow enough that we can make progress. Um, there is actually, there are some other competitions that are related, and I talked about this a little bit, um, StarCraft and um, Dota 2 are some competitions where um, computers are starting to compete against humans, and um, I don't remember what the prizes are, but there, I do believe that there are prizes offered for those um, to, to make them better. Um, you have the same thing with Computer Go. Um, AlphaGo, I, I don't remember if AlphaGo won a prize, but there have been prizes for people to play to develop computer programs that can play Go competitively against the world's best humans. Mm-hmm. And the but those in some cases those prizes were open for a decade or two, and um, it was I think because we just didn't know how to develop um, computer programs that could play Go effectively because the search space going back to this theme about search engines and, and search algorithms the search space was just too big and we needed to find a way to narrow down the search into um, something more like a search beam from a search tree hmm. and the final thought I have on that is that I actually don't think that the field is progressing too slowly I think we've made a huge amount of progress in the last um, 10, 20 years um, the error rates we're getting on that image recognition challenge that I mentioned it plummeted from uh, I don't remember the exact amount but they've plummeted from um, I think it was around 16% to about 2 or 3% just in the last few years. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think we are making quite a bit of progress. Um, it might still be a while before we have um, robots who can walk around and converse with us, mm-hmm. but, um, but I think we're getting there. Okay. So as far as how you did your research, so you mentioned you looked at all these papers and tried to summarize them, but also did you get to... Um, did you get to... Uh, play with any of these these uh, examples that you that were researched and did you do any interviews um, with the people who did the research mm-hmm. I did um, I don't know that I got to play with any of these things I mean I, I played with some neural networks a little bit to um, just uh, to get some intuition and to get some figures for the paper uh, for the book um, I did some interviews of some people uh, working in the field um, uh, not as many as I'd hoped, uh, but I did do several interviews of people who are in the field. Um, the um, primarily with um, Jeffrey Plain Watson, um, someone who works on um, StarCraft, uh, and um, uh, I'm trying to blank on another one, but there were a couple more that I did as well. So, how many papers in total, or, or approximately, would you say you uh-huh. you uh, you used for this? Uh, that's a good question. I would. A really good question. Um, uh-huh. I know that there were over a hundred sources overall, but that was that included the magazines and newspaper articles um, mm-hmm. as well. Um, the I would estimate that the number of papers was probably on the order of um, between twenty five and fifty or so. Mm-hmm. And um, the it's, in some cases I could depend on relatively small number of papers because. Um, those papers were um, pretty thorough about the topic, and so it was largely a matter of taking the ideas in the papers and um, trying to think of ways to make them accessible and um, to incorporate um, elements of what was happening from, uh, according to the news media, into into the narrative. Mm-hmm. What part of the research was most enjoyable? <laughs> um, I think probably the. That's a good question. I mean, I think that just um, when I would start a new chapter and just start to read about the different um, material that was out there and actually reading about how these different things worked, I think that, that was just enjoyable to me. So um, basically, like going to a coffee shop and spending a, a few hours um, reading a paper, and um, 
I mean, it was difficult to understand the paper in just a few hours. Usually I'd have to go over it again and again and um, get different sources and then come back to the paper. Mm -hmm. um, but just the, the whole idea of like sitting at a coffee shop and reading these papers was to me enjoyable. I don't know that any one paper um, was better than another one, but, um, but I just found this process of, to me it felt like going back to college, for example, and just reading papers that the, the professor had assigned to us, for example. Mm -hmm. What did you find that was most surprising in this research? One thing that I think was a little bit surprising to me was the the reaction that um, some people, uh, I, I guess, let me rephrase this. People, I think, in the in the field can um, can take um, certain things. Um, I don't want to say personally, but it's important to people that they get credit for the stuff that they do because they work very hard on these in these areas. Mm -hmm. And they um, they they might be in, in academia where it's important to to develop their their reputation. And so I think that there can tend to be um, sometimes turf battles. Uh, mm -hmm. And turf battle is a strong word, but I think that there can be cases where um, someone who comes to a a field and is relatively new to it uh, may be seen as an outsider. Mm -hmm. And and I don't want to get get into specifics, but I I I, I was talking to someone about. Um, some of their research, and I, I had them review a draft, and and they actually expressed some negative emotion about about the draft because of the, the way I portrayed someone um, as as having perhaps too much of a role in this field mm. when um, when they were actually a latecomer to the field. And so I think that I, I didn't really expect anything except the technical details to show up when I was talking to to people, mm. and I think that sometimes non technical details, personal details, would show up. Um, and I'm not making a judgment about it being a good or bad thing. I think it's actually a perfectly predictable thing in a lot of mm -hmm. um, a lot of fields. But but it was surprising to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, competition of of any sort with high stakes possibly will will create yeah. that sort of uh, atmosphere and situation sometimes. So, uh, yep, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, what was the most difficult part to research? Was there an issue that you really took a long time to grapple with and? Before you figured it out, or something that still you 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 still haven't gotten your your mind around fully. So one thing that I I think there were a couple of things. Um, I mean, in some cases, like with self driving cars, um, a lot of the, the there is some research coming out, but a lot of the um, modern research in self driving cars is, um, is 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 essentially managed by private companies, and it's their their own IP, and so. It can be difficult sometimes to find a lot of um, uh, details about what's happening in a company unless it's already been published. So, so I guess I'd say that this, um, the the research barrier um, when trying to research things that private companies are working on um, is it can be one challenge. I don't think that that was as big a challenge though as um, trying to find ways to explain um, different ideas. So I mentioned the um, IBM's Jeopardy playing Watson program, for example, and I think that that was a chapter where I know that I struggled, and I had a, a friend review that chapter, and and he was, he was helpful, but he also explained that I, I needed to work on it some more, and so I went back and figured out some ways to explain it differently, and I think that the challenge there was um, largely around trying to find ways to, um, to explain the material without it coming across as um, reading a textbook um, because I, my biggest concern I think was that people reading the book might read it might think that it's more of a textbook and that it feels like a chore. Mm -hmm. Was there anything you discovered that emotionally moved you and that could be something uplifting, worrisome, particularly amusing? Um, that's a good question. I think the thing that to me was the most moving was reading about some of these automata that existed in the 17th century. Um, I, I found that, that I was just trying to figure out a, a way to open the book. I, I came upon some of some of these devices that I thought were just very elegant. And so these are the sorts of devices where um, you you have, for example, a, essentially a machine. Maybe it looks like a human that can play a flute. And um, and it's you think of it as a gigantic jukebox. Uh, jukebox where it's um, or not jukebox. 
16 new music box mm-hmm. where um, maybe it even has a key to wind it up and then it starts to play a song that's um, encoded on duds sticking out of the rotating drum. And uh, beyond that, there there was um, actually, I think it was maybe a Disney movie about one of these Altamasa where mm-hmm. they could illustrate, they could draw illustrations. And, and these things actually existed. They, they could write a, a sentence or they could make an illustration or they could um, play the harpsichord. Um, any number of different things, and it was, I just thought the creativity during that period and the sophistication of these different automata was spectacular. And so to me, that was very moving, and it, it made me feel as if we're, maybe we're in kind of a similar sort of situation right now. Mm-hmm. Um, is there anything in, in science fiction that particularly inspires you, since, you know, you're obviously into this? I think for myself, personally, um, well, there's an Easter egg in the book, and um, you can find it if you look at the first letter of each chapter. Um, and uh, there, are, so there are several different movies that I um, have seen that I thought I should fit in there. Um, I don't know that there's one particular story in science fiction that stands out to me, or one particular author. Mm-hmm. Um, I think generally, to me, the um, the most interesting questions, though, that I've seen um, written about. Uh, are around the the philosophical questions about when something actually becomes um, conscious yeah. and um, its self-realization. And so I think that there's going to be a, a point at which um, machines will um, achieve enough consciousness to have self-realization, and then there will be this ethical issue that we face where um, the question will be, um, should humans um, control these machines that have their own their own will, for example. It's essentially a question of will. Um, but I don't know that there were specific books or, um, or movies or anything like that that um, that caused me to think about this. It's more, I think, just a collection of different themes that show up again and again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, whenever I talk about AI with someone and, you know, robots with intelligence, uh-huh. I think Blade Runner, you know, that, that one yeah, pops yeah. in. What do you hope the book will do? I, I hope that it will um, get some people excited about AI. I think that there, my hope is to, I, I think several things. One, to get people, uh, especially uh, maybe high schoolers, excited about AI. I also hope to to teach people in the more general public about AI and to help to, um, I don't want to say remove some of the hype, but at least to help people understand what's hype and what's not hype. And um, even things like politicians, I, I think that, for example, with politicians, there's probably uh, not very much understanding of how these things work. And I worry that there will be, um, that, that as the field develops, that if people don't understand um, how, how these things work, that they either won't create regulations or they will create regulations that don't really take into account um, some things that we should be aware of. And I think that we're still years away, decades away um, from the need for a lot of these things. Mm-hmm. But I, there are still cases where the public, I think, doesn't understand a lot of the nuances with, um, with these things. And I think um, my hope is to help people understand some of the nuance so that even if they don't necessarily know how to go and build a self-driving car, for example, mm-hmm. um, or even if they don't know how to go build a neural network that can recognize a picture of a cat, um, they can still understand how those things work that they know um, what's reasonable regulation and what's not, for example. Mm-hmm. Can you speak to any difficulties you had in getting the book finished or published and how you overcame those? I don't think there were too many difficulties in getting it um, finished or published. I, I tried to stick to a um, an aggressive schedule, so I wanted to get the book out. As soon as I was um, talking to the publisher, I wanted to um, get the book out as early as possible within this, I guess, the constraints of just having a, um, a full-time job. Mm-hmm. And so I ended up um, telling myself that I would write at least 500 words per day. Mm-hmm. And um, that was typical for a weekday when I would basically, I would write during my commute to work, I would write during the commute home, and then I would write in the evening and on weekends. On weekends, I could usually get anywhere from 1,500 to maybe 2,500 words written mm-hmm. per page per day. And I think that that quota that I gave myself, I actually kept a spreadsheet. I haven't pulled that up in a little while, but I had kept a spreadsheet. 
tracking how much, how many words I wrote down each day. And, um, and I think that just seeing that, um, gave me the reassurance that I was making progress. Mm-hmm. And it, um, and I, not just the reassurance, but it was So I knew that if I missed a day, then I had to make up for it within a day or two. Mm-hmm. What's your next writing project? That's a good question. I've, I've been debating that. Um, I don't know that it will be a book about, um, uh, AI and machine learning. Um, one, there are several different topics I, I have in mind. Um, uh, one of them is basically to, to write a book about how the human body works. Um, mm-hmm. This is an area where I probably need to partner with someone who's a medical doctor because I don't know enough about the field. But my thought is to, um, to take the idea behind a book like Cosmos, which is um, essentially an exploration of um, the Earth and the universe and such, and to do the same sort of thing with the human body. So, for example, um, I think most people don't know how the spleen works or what it does. Most people don't understand why we sleep or what the brain work does or, or how it works. Mm-hmm. And the, a lot of these are still open questions. The medical community doesn't know exactly how the brain works. But we still know way more than, than people um, think. And so I personally would find it to be fascinating to read a book that just explains how a lot of these different parts of your body work. Um, in, in a way that's completely accessible. Um, this is, again, just an idea. I'm not sure that I'll, I'll do this, but it's something that I've been thinking about. And there are a couple of other ideas. Um, one of them is actually a little bit more political, um, in that uh, taking um, the different um, issues that people care about and surveying a bunch of people and seeing where people fall on the spectrum. My my general hunch is that most people don't tend to be as polarized as as you might think from the public discussion, Mm -hmm. and that most people actually tend to be um, somewhere in the middle. And so the idea would be to emphasize where people feel, uh, how people feel about these issues, Mm -hmm. um, to emphasize that as Americans, we most of us are actually somewhere in the middle, and most of us actually agree with each other on most things, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a small chance I might work on a... um, a fiction book, but I'm not sure about that yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, as you can tell, I'm um, still not really sure about what the next project will be. Um, mm-hmm. I haven't started on it yet, and I, I probably won't start on it for a little while. But, mm-hmm. um, but I'm still thinking about it. Okay. So where will people be able to find the book, and where can people can people follow your thoughts and, and work online, social media, or anything like that? Um, yes. So the, the book is available for pre-order on Amazon. It comes out at the end of October. There is an audiobook version of it that is, um, is already out. And, um, you, if not Amazon, you can find it on the MIT Press website and a number of other sites like that. Um, people can follow me on Twitter. My username is S-E-A-N-N-Y-G. That's Shawnee G. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you can also follow me on, on Quora. Uh, I have a blog, but the blog is um, not as much related to the book. So I say if you're um, interested in following me, I'd love to um, see you on, on Twitter. Again, the handle is Shawnee G, S-E-A-N-N-Y-G. I've not been on Quora, actually. Um, how, how, do, how do people uh-huh. find you there? Just by your name? Yeah, I think just my name, um, Sean Garish, S-E-A-N-G-E-R-R-I-S-H. Mm-hmm. Um, I... And that's actually one of the areas where I started to write first and, and realized that, um, that people might, that people might want to read some things that I had to say, for example. So, um, I tend to answer questions more about, um, the technology industry and about, um, things related to the technology industry. Um, for example, like how to get a job as a data scientist. I am interested in other topics as well, just general machine learning and data science stuff as well. That's all the questions I have. Do you have any final words? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I'd love to um, hear what any of your readers or any of your listeners think about the book. Mm-hmm. Um, any feedback is, is welcome. Um, if, if they have any ideas on um, great projects, that would be good follow-ups to the book. I'd also love to hear that. Um, but my, my main hope is just that people can um, learn about some of these ideas. Um, that's one of the main goals of the book. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to visit chrisalvarez.com or theartofsciencefiction.com for more great interviews, photos, and articles. 
Your visits help support this podcast. Please remember that my first name, Chris, does not have an H in it. One of the best ways to provide feedback for this podcast is to rate me on iTunes. Please give me a good rating if you liked it, or feel free to give me a bad rating if you didn't. I'll use that feedback to make this a better podcast. You can also follow me on Instagram under Chris Alvarez Sci Fi, on Facebook under Chris Alvarez WLC, on YouTube under Chris Alvarez WLC, and on Twitter under Chris Alvarez WLC. Thanks for listening and keep imagining the future.